Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, hey. Hi. Uh, thank you for being here on this uh, beautiful November day. My name is Ernest Morrell. Uh, I'm an associate dean for humanities in the College of Arts and Letters here at Notre Dame. It's my pleasure to welcome you. This is our sixth event at what we call the Ahead of the Game. It's a lecture series um, sponsored by the college. We have one more uh, for the terrific tech game. Over the course of the season, um, in the previous five talks, we've had members uh, from our faculty all over the college who shared um, their research with us in, in accessible ways um, and, and also um, very dynamic ways. Before we get started and introduce um, our speaker for today, I'd like to thank my colleagues in the Department of Music and Programming Sacred Music for uh, letting us use this, this really uh, wonderful venue. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge um, Emily Hannon, um, our student assistant, is Emily in the room? She's probably one of the people outside of Great you. Um, but I do see um, Megan Snyder and Jenny Peterson and Chloe Leach, our, uh, our senior administrative coordinators in the college, uh, who work with our speakers and, and do many other things to make the series happen. Our speaker today is Mark Sanders, a professor of English and Africana Studies um, here at the University of Notre Dame. Um, he also wears many other hats that we'll talk about today, including the Director of the Initiative on Race and Resilience. Um, Mark specializes in 20th century and contemporary African American and Afro Latin American literature and culture. He has written a study of Sterling Brown's poetry, Afro Modernist Aesthetics, and the poetry of Sterling A. Brown, and has edited two volumes of Sterling Brown's prose. He's also edited and translated the autobiography of an Afro Cuban soldier in Cuba's final war of independence. A Black Soldier's Story, The Narrative of Ricardo Betrell and the Cuban War of Independence. Professor Sanders teaches undergraduate and graduate courses on 19th, 20th, and 21st century African American literature and culture, exploring issues of racial and cultural identity, citizenship, and freedom. In addition, he teaches courses on Afro Latin American literature and culture with emphases on Cuba, Colombia, and Ecuador. He's currently co editing and co translating the poetry of Afro Colombian poets. Romo Bustos Aguirre and Pedro Blas Julio Romero. Um, as you can see, Mark is a busy person. I don't know when he has time to do things like eat and sleep. But we're happy to have him as a colleague. Uh, today's talk is entitled Race and Racism in Higher Education Introducing Notre Dame's Initiative on Race and Resilience. Taking up historical and contemporary issues of race and systematic racism in the U.S. and across the globe, uh, Mark's talk will review the mission and specific activities of Notre Dame's new initiative on race and resilience. Um, he is a tremendous leader and, and also just a warm and uh, engaging colleague and a friend. Uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Marks. Hello. That was a test, but thank you for responding. Good afternoon. Uh, it really is wonderful to see you all here today. Uh, thank you for coming. You don't have to be here. Uh, the fact that you're here on a football Friday when there are so many other things for you to be doing, I think um, speaks to the urgency of the issues that are addressed in this new uh, Notre Dame's initiative on race. In specific, the Notre Dame Initiative on Race articulates a commitment, quote, to assist the world to create justice grounded in love. The Initiative on Race and its commitment to racial justice in its most elegant and aspirational expressions is a concerted and ongoing act of love. The redress of systemic racism one of the greatest impediments to equality and justice for all is an act of love. The support and celebration of communities of color are acts of love. I'm Mark Sanders, professor of English and Africana Studies here at Notre Dame. And it's my pleasure to be the inaugural director of the Notre Dame Initiative on Race and Resilience. And I have the honor and privilege today of talking with you about this initiative. But first, I want to thank Professor Ernest Morell for his uh, introduction. Um, some of it was actually true. 
I, Ernest is just a, an absolutely inspiring colleague to work with. Uh, we came in at the same time in the fall of 2017, and both of us have been asked to, to take on some pretty hefty administrative work, and it really is inspirational to work next to Ernest. So thank you, Ernest, for your leadership. I want to thank Dean Mastillo and the Dean's Office for inviting me to give this talk. And thank you to Kim Murray, who I think is in the back. Uh, she is handing out some, um, some printed material about the initiative. Without Kim's work uh, to help me put this presentation together, all of this would be absolutely impossible. So thank you, Kim. In 30 minutes or so, I'll walk through a brief history of the initiative, its mission, its vision, its programming, composition, and location. And then we'll have time for questions and comments, indeed time for a fuller conversation about the initiative, about racial politics, the role of higher, higher education in relation to racial politics, excuse me, and ultimately Notre Dame's contribution to that conversation. So let's begin. Why should Notre Dame invest money and energy in an initiative on race? To my mind, there are several compelling reasons. First, centers, institutes, initiatives on race, at this point in the history of higher education, are an industry standard and have been so for over 20 years. All of our peer institutions, University of Chicago, Stanford, Harvard, Yale, Duke, on and on, you know the list as well as I. All have centers or institutes on race that promote research and programming, addressing historic and contemporary systemic racism, particularly in the United States, and producing analysis of contemporary politics, analysis that points to solutions and changes in policy. But the fact that we are simply keeping up really isn't a very compelling intellectual argument for doing this. The real question is, why have all these other institutions established these centers? Well, the establishment of, reflects a fundamental obligation of institutions of higher earning, I'm sorry, of higher learning in a participatory democracy. To my mind, all institutions of higher learning provide four fundamental things. They produce an informed, I'm sorry, they produce an informed and discerning electorate. They provide information and analysis. They model informed and civil debate. And they serve as sites for informed and civil debate. Institutions of higher learning do these four things in order to address the most pressing issues that challenge us, that challenge us as a national community. And as we have seen over the past year and a half, race continues to be one of the defining issues of our time. Indeed, an analysis of race and racism is absolutely crucial to understanding the history of democracy in this country and essential to securing its future, indeed essential to surviving this current crisis. Black writers have been stating for more than two centuries now that African Americans are the measure of the success or failure of this grand experiment in freedom and democracy. The extent to which blacks have been and continue to be excluded from, the, from full participation in the body politic is the exact distance between our political reality and our aspirations. That is the sign of our failure indeed to form a more perfect union. Therefore, Notre Dame bears the same obligations that all institutions of higher learning bear to address the historic and contemporary threat to the founding ideals of this republic. Not surprisingly, Notre Dame reflects the larger national community in which it resides. Racism and the struggle to overcome it inform the, inform the shape and nature of the Notre Dame community. Black, Latinx, and Native American alumni have testified to the challenges of life as a person of color on this campus. 
and current student faculty and staff of color often attest to the distance Notre Dame still has to go to be fully welcoming to all its members. Therefore, in a local context in which students, faculty, and staff of color often struggle to call Notre Dame home, and in a national context in which a violent segment of the national community can attack the Capitol building in an attempt to nullify an election, indeed to reject the prospect of multiracial democracy, in a context of ongoing efforts to suppress or nullify votes from black and, black and brown communities across the country, now is a propitious moment to act. Before I advance this slide, I meant to say, of course, that's my contact information, and please feel free and encouraged to contact me. I would love to hear from you your comments, questions, and suggestions. We are still in the process, as you, as you will see, of building this initiative, and so the impact of this community and the input of this community is enormously important. So what is the mission of this initiative on race? The Notre Dame Initiative on Race and Resilience is a community of scholars, students, artists, and activists committed to the redress of systemic racism and the support of communities of color. Global in scope, comparative and interdisciplinary and critical approach, the initiative creates a space, intellectual, physical, and emotional, where our members gather in solidarity to exchange ideas, develop their projects, and celebrate the expressive cultures of communities of color. The vision, by confronting systemic racism and supporting communities of color, the Initiative on Race will aid Notre Dame in its Catholic mission to cultivate, quote, a disciplined sensibility to the poverty, injustice, and oppression that burdens so many, end quote. But what does this mean in more particular practical terms? It means that we make manifest our ideals in the areas that Notre Dame champions and promotes every day, research, education, and community empowerment and engagement. I'll flesh out these three foci momentarily, but before doing so, I'd like to back up a moment to get a sense of how and why we got here. Though the initiative is new to Notre Dame, work on race and the support of communities of color have taken place here for decades on the part of many individuals, programs, and departments dedicated to racial equality. The Department of Africana Studies serves as a wonderful example. Its roots go back to the creation of the, of the African Studies Program and Black Studies Program in the 60s and 70s, re respectively. Leaders such as Father Hesburgh, Joseph Scott, Erskine Peters, Hugh Page, Richard Pierce, Diane Penderhughes, and many more created and sustained a space in which the histories, politics, and cultures of Africans and African diasporic peoples received rigorous critical reflection and where black students in particular could find the guidance and emotional support they needed. One example of this support was the Erskine Peters Dissertation Fellowship Program that devoted funding, that I'm sorry, that provided funding and mentoring to black graduate students, producing a number of influential scholars, including James Ford III, the author of Thinking Through Crisis and the winner of the William Sanders Scarborough Prize. Oddly enough, uh, James Ford III is right now or just has done a video conversation with uh, our um, artist in residence, um, uh, Reginald Dwayne Betts, about whom I'll speak momentarily. In addition, or the, um, uh, one of the, the individual efforts on the part of Maria McKenna, Richard Pierce, Father Paulinus Odozor, and many others have helped to nurture stellar black alumni such as Nicole Hannah-Jones, MacArthur Genius Award winner and creator of the 1619 Project of the New York Times. 
But the history of Africana studies is, by, is but one example of so many. The Institute for Latino Studies, the Clow Center on Civil and Human Rights, the Gender Studies Program, the Center for Literary Education, the KNEB Center for Teaching and Learning, the Center for Social Concerns, the Department of American Studies, and the Lou Center for Asian and Asian, Asian and Asian Studies, Asia and Asian Studies, and the Office for Student Affairs, and so many more for decades have helped, the research, helped to research race and support students, faculty, and staff of color. Therefore, when Dean Sarah Mustilla became Dean of the College of Arts and Letters in the summer of 2018 and began to organize faculty and resources for an initiative on race, she had a solid foundation on which to build. In March of 2020, she convened a committee to research and write a proposal, and so through the spring and summer of 2020, Professors LaDonna Forsgren, some of you heard her speak earlier today, Dan Graff, uh, Jaime Pensado, and Asarine Vandervliet Olumi worked long and hard to give words to Dean Mastillo's vision. Most recently, Professors Maurizio Albahari, Jamie Black, and Diane Penderhughes have joined the group as it transformed from the committee to the permanent advisory board for the initiative. And all along the way, Alicia Dennis, Alyssa Doro, Kate Gary, Tina Elkins, and Kim Murray have provided essential staff support without which the initiative would not be possible. All of us who believe in the work of the Initiative on Race owe everyone at Notre Dame, past and present, who has worked to build a more racially just world a great debt of gratitude. And so now the three foci. Research. As I stated earlier, the initiative on race is global in scope and comparative and interdisciplinary and critical approach. This means that we attend to systems of oppression predicated on race anywhere and everywhere across the globe. This approach allows us to compare systems of racism, uh, I'm sorry, systems of racial oppression, say in South Africa and Colombia, for example, as a means of lending greater insight into both and to understanding more fully how American racial oppression fits into a global paradigm. In the broadest sense, the initiative promotes research that establishes bodies of knowledge on race and racism on which future research may be founded. Topics such as health, um, health disparities and health disparity outcomes between communities of color and white communities, data on race and the environment, uh, information and data on mass incarceration, uh, research on wealth or the wealth gap, education, voting, and more. More specifically, just making sure I'm lined up with my notes here, IRR promotes uh, the examination of various configurations of race and racism within their historical context, the study of uh, racial relationships between, I'm sorry, relationship between race and inequality, the recovery of narratives of resistance, the celebration of contribu and contributions of BIPOC voices to the construction of our communities, uh, and the recovery and preservation of oral histories. In a more practical sense, we provide the following. I hope this is, here we go, right. Short-term grants for faculty, research grants for undergraduates, a scholar in residence program about which I'll say more momentarily, an artist in residence program, I'll say more about that too and once we uh, get to talk about Dwayne Betts, um, a postdoc fellowship for recent PhDs, uh, dissertation fellow, um, fellowships for, for graduate students, we want to participate in the college's five plus one program, a spotlight program for uh, faculty who have, uh, faculty and graduate students who've had major publications, and eventually a biannual conference on rotating, rotating themes. And right, the last one there is uh, uh, the possibility of a journal on uh, the study of race and resilience. So these are the things that we 
either fund right now and or are in the process of organizing and funding. And we are hosting for the first time our very first uh, research fellow, Scott Barton. Scott Barton is an anthropologist and studies Afro-Brazilian religion and food ways. And before he became a scholar, he was a professional chef. You can actually go on YouTube and see clips of him preparing meals, and he is absolutely wonderful. Uh, we are sharing Scott, or we are hosting him in conjunction, partnership with the Notre Dame, uh, Notre Dame Institute for Advanced Study, NDIAS. Education. Again, emphasizing inter interdisciplinarity and a global perspective, the initiative develops undergraduate and graduate academic programs in the comparative study of race. Ad academic programming initiatives include course development grants to faculty and graduate students, Sponsorship for pedagogy and workshops and colloquia across the university. Pedagogy, pedag ooh, pedagogy workshops uh, in partnership with the Notre Dame Learning Caneb Center and the Center for Liter Literacy Education. We also hope to have education outreach uh, through a lecture series, through arts exhibits, film series, and other cultural programs, often in collaboration with, with existing units on campus. Uh, faculty student mentorship program for faculty of, of color and um, graduate students of color. A faculty mentorship program, and as I mentioned earlier, an artist in residence program. And the third foci is community empowerment. Engaging organizations within and beyond the Notre Dame campus, the initiative promotes community engagement to support communities of color and to support organizations confronting systemic racism. At the heart of this program is the pr practitioner in residence program. And the heart of this, I'm sorry, in the heart of this uh, area, this foci is the practitioner in residence program. Dan Graff, uh, who's in the history department. I'll just say a little bit about him in a moment when I show you all of the board members. Uh, this was one of his contributions as we were writing this proposal in the summer of 2020. Uh, he really insisted that if we want to do this, we have to have experts working in areas, working in communities beyond Notre Dame's campus. And so the idea is that someone who is working on issue X, say water in Flint, Michigan, would be hosted here on campus. That person would have access to uh, the intellectual resources at Notre Dame. Uh, she, he, or they uh, would educate the Notre Dame community on the work that they are doing and also take us off campus so that we can aid in that work and ultimately understand more profoundly um, the impact of that work. We also hope to have an artist uh, tied to that, the artist in resident, who will be in conversation with the practitioner in residence. And of course, active collaboration uh, with organizations both on campus and beyond Notre Dame's campus. Is LaDonna here? LaDonna Forsgren? She's not, that's fine. Um, several of these were her particular ideas as we were writing uh, the development of a program, a K through 12 program, as well as hosting a summer young scholars program uh, for potential first generation college students. We seek to bind all three areas through the arts because we feel the arts have a special capacity 
to convey complexity and contradiction on multiple intellectual and emotional registers. Indeed, while writing the proposal for the initiative, the committee underwent an exercise where each member wrote her or his own definition of race. And what became self-evident to the group was something that each one of us knew implicitly, if not intuitively, given our respective work on race, that at the heart of the concept there's a critical tension, if not impossible, opposition. Race is at once a tool of colonization, a means of domination and exploitation, and at the same time, a site of identity, resilience, and resistance. We never want to reduce race to racism. We want the initiative to be fully alive to this critical tension, fully alive to the possibility of race as both poison and antidote, as it were. And so we conceive of the arts as the best way to remain attentive to this both and. The arts are infinitely creative with presenting us, with, in presenting us, with the destructive capacity of race and the multiple ways in which communities of color identify and assert themselves as agents in the ongoing process of their self-making. When we think about the arts, we want to think as broadly and cre creatively as possible. Therefore, artistry would include the more obvious areas, literature, graphic arts, music, dance, drama, etc., filmmaking. And it would include less obvious yet essential forms of expression, particularly for communities taking full advantage of vernacular materials at their immediate disposal. For example, food and the culinary arts, quilt making and knitting, basket weaving and refashioning found objects into sculpture. So each year we will host an artist in residence. She, he, or they will represent their work to the greater Notre Dame community, engage the academic programming around their work, visit uh, classes studying their work, provide workshops in their craft, on their craft, and collaborate with a practitioner in residence to present their artistry to the communities um, the practitioner is serving. And so as I mentioned earlier this year, we are proud to host, again in conjunction with NDIAS, our first artist in residence, Reginald Dwayne Betts. Professor Betts is a poet, memoirist, essayist, dramatist, and lawyer practicing in New Haven, Connecticut, while earning his PhD in law at Yale University. Professor Betts first achieved literary acclaim through his first collection of poetry, Shahid Reads His Own Palm, and his autobiography, A Question of Freedom, a memoir of learning and survival and coming of age in prison, a chronicle of his life in prison as an adolescent and young adult. This past September, he was awarded the MacArthur Genius Award. Since the beginning of the semester, he has visited classes, and he did a virtual performance of a portion of his one-man show based on his most recent collection of poetry, Felon. The one-man show is titled Felon, an American Washi Tale, and he will perform it live and in person here at Notre Dame on November 17th and 18th in the Philbin Studio Theater. That's in the DuBartolo Performing Arts Building. Please check our website or the NDIAS website for more information. Further illustrating the initiative's investment in the arts Last year, IRR partnered with the, uh, with the Department of English and Creative Writing to appoint uh, the very promising young novelists Dion Bremeyer and Xavier Aquino. Um, Dion Bremeyer has just published her first book, uh, Quentin, I mean, sorry, Quint, and her, her collection of short stories. Um, islands will be out in 2022. I think some of you all went to a panel where these two were speaking. Um, and Xavier uh, is about to uh, publish his first novel, Valario, that will be out uh, next spring or summer. 
The Board of Advisors represents many of the disciplines across the college. I mentioned them, I listed them earlier. Uh, Mauricio Albahari is in uh, anthropology, Jamie Bleck in political science, LaDonna Forsgren, whom many of you all saw this morning in FTT, uh, Dan Graff, whom I just mentioned in history in the Center for Social Concerns, uh, Jamie Pensado in history and the Kellogg Center, um, Diane Pender Hughes in political science and Africana studies, and Asarine Vandervliet Olumi in English and creative writing. In terms of greater composition, we are now 83 faculty affiliates representing nearly all the disciplines in the College of Arts and Letters. Uh, to my quick glance, I think only Russian and German and psychology are not represented here, and we're, we're working on that. Uh, and then in terms of graduate student affiliation, we have 40 uh, representing creative writing, English, history, political science, psychology, sociology, and theology. Also, we continue to take in new affiliates. In fact, we just completed our most recent evaluation process last week, and we anticipate to have another round next semester. And in terms of undergraduates, we strive to support undergraduates who feel moved by the mission of the initiative. And judging from students' reactions thus far, there are quite a, there are quite a few who are passionate about confronting systemic racism and supporting communities of color. To support undergraduate research, I, the IRR is planning undergraduate research grants. Uh, we will have a um, research assistant program pairing undergraduates with faculty doing research. And we will have IRR-sponsored research projects in which uh, undergraduates can, can participate in, uh, say, uh, it, we're doing an oral history that undergraduates can, can conduct interviews. If we're gathering data, say, on voting, uh, undergraduates can participate in the process of, of gathering and digesting data, and therefore not only just learn the, learn the content of the issue at, at hand, but also hone their research skills. Furthermore, we want the physical and emotional space of IRR to be one that undergraduates can call their own, a space where they can gather to exchange ideas and develop their own projects. And needless to say, all the programming, the lectures, the film series, the panels, discussions, et cetera, are open to undergraduates. So where are we? Technically speaking, we're in my basement. We will be very soon on the third floor of O'Shaughnessy across the hall, just as you get off of the elevator and to the left. There you will find a suite of offices that will accommodate several fellows, uh, the, admi the administrative assistant, a student worker, and the director. And this space should be completed sometime next semester. Just adjacent to that, uh, will be the gathering space. It's currently referred to as the loft, uh, and that will be a space for individual work, for workshops, uh, for meetings and small lectures and conferences. Um, that space will be radically redesigned. Um, those of you who know it now uh, know that it's not particularly inviting or functional. Um, we will have, as you can see here, Hopefully you can see uh, clearly uh, much more natural lighting. Right now there's absolutely none. And so this, the lighting on the left, the windows on the left are, are basically punching out the, the ceiling and these are skylights uh, and the, the, the space goes back this way. And so hopefully with more natural lighting and more uh, comfortable furniture, this will be a conducive space. Um, for gathering and to, uh, to support our collective work. As I mentioned, part of the initiative's mission is to partner with other organizations on and beyond campus to advance the work 
of, the con of confronting systemic racism and supporting communities of color. At this point, our community partners include, as you can see, the Center for Social Concerns, uh, the DeBartolo Performing Arts Center, Notre Dame Department of Sociology, um, the Division of uh, Student Affairs, uh, MSPS, and the Snipe Museum of Art. Part of my job as director is to increase our partnerships, particularly in the broader Michiana area, not simply for the sake of partnerships, but to ensure that the initiative, and by extension the university, makes a substantive and long-lasting contribution to this communal struggle. Hopefully, I've given you a sense of who we are, why we are, and where we've come from, now let me just say a few words about where we're going. In terms of short-term goals, over the next two years, we are working to implement the Protect Practitioner in Residence Program, which I mentioned earlier, the Mentoring Program for Graduate Students and Faculty of Color, the Five Plus One Program, and while continuing to make available research grants course development grants, and pedagogical development grants. And while we continue to co-sponsor events on campus, we will continue our Sojourner Truth keynote lecture on race and resistance. Also, IRR is conducting two searches, one in conjunction with the Department of Africana Studies, and that's a search for a historian of slavery and one in partnership with film, television, and theater, FTT, for a critic, for a scholar of African American film. Um, you might have heard uh, Sarah Mastillo, Dean Mastillo, talking about the initiative in many ways. One of the ways that she talks about it as a vehicle or an engine through which the college does more aggressive hiring, particularly of faculty of color in, in order to increase the diversity of, of the faculty and the art, the racial diversity for faculty in the College of Arts and Letters. And so this is the one of the ways in which she's been really quite aggressive. As um, I mentioned earlier and Ernest mentioned earlier, we did two searches, well, we, we did two searches. Uh, one of them resulted in two appointments last year and we are uh, repeating one search from last year as well as an additional search will hopefully yield uh, two more faculty members by next fall. In terms of long-term goals, three to five years out, first we want to continue with all of the above. In addition, we will strive to implement a major and minor in comparative race and ethnic studies. We want to host a pipeline program for people of color in the academy, such as the MMUF and or, and or the McNair program, um, you might have heard um, Tracy Canada, who I think is sitting in the back. I really can't see anybody, but there she is, right. Um, I speak about this the, earlier this morning, the Mellon Mays Undergraduate Fellowship. And pipeline programs, I think, are really important. As I said, uh, the, the college in particular, and I think um, based on um, statements and, and efforts on the provost part, Mary. Mari, Mari Lynn Miranda, um, the agenda of both the university and the college is to diversify, racially speaking, the faculty. But just diversity, diversifying Notre Dame's faculty is really insufficient if all we're doing is taking faculty from Duke or Stanford or one of our peer institutions if we're just playing a zero-sum game, if we are invested in the process of diversifying the, the academy writ large to create an academy that actually reflects more accurately the US populace as a whole, then we also have to be active in participating in these pipeline programs that increase the number of people, people of color going into graduate school and ultimately becoming members of the professor. So this is part of our uh, longer term goals. And as I mentioned, 
Um, the right, right. And also, finally, increasing the number of research fellows and beginning to integrate our rotating themes into our programming. How am I doing with time? That's, I need to be quiet or wrap it up right now? OK. All right, well, then you don't get to hear me read that poem because I've been asked to. I'm, not, I'm just teasing you all. This is a poem by Robert Hayden, a mid-century African-American writer, um, African-American poet. Uh, this is a Petrarchan sonnet that is completely reinvented to bend it towards thinking about the life of Frederick Douglass in particular, but more broadly, the way in which that life reflects our broader aspirations about uh, where this democracy is supposed to ultimately end up. And so I will leave it to you all to read it on your own because I'm getting the sign. Um, but I think that this poem um, capsulates better than I in prose where ultimately we want to go. So with that said, thank you very much for your time and attention. And please, I would love to hear your comments and questions. Yes. First of all, Professor Sanders, thanks so much for your presentation earlier and for this presentation. And for those of us who uh, were there when Dean Mastillo was talking about her, uh, her, her vision around um, some kind of her, her three eyes um, and really putting diversity, equity, and inclusion um, high on her priority list, um, I, I couldn't have imagined that you would be able to create something so fulsome as what you created here. So, so thank you for leading that process to get us to this place. One thing I've been listening for today is um, early, um, earlier this morning we heard from the provost uh, about a lot of things, but as it related to diversity and inclusion, she, she, she said something that, that really resonated with me as, a, as, a, um, as an alum. Uh, uh, she said, you know, in talking to students of color that their feeling has been that um, it, Notre Dame is a great place to be from, but not a great place to be at. Right. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I couldn't have said it better if I were trying to describe what it, what it felt like to be a student um, when I was here in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, and so I'm, I'm really curious just about how we're thinking about the student experience and being more inclusive, right. and whether we think that the agenda you have outlined here is enough on the education, the research, and right. if, if, or if there's something more that, that we'll have to do to um, make students of color, undergrads in particular, who live, who live here, right? This is their, this is their community for four years feel more a part of the community when they are here in, in small numbers. So um, if you could just kind of expound on this inclusivity idea. Well, thank you for um, that prompt. Um, and thank you for um, your reflections on, on what we're trying to build thus far. A quick answer to the question as to whether the initiative is going to be sufficient. The answer is no. Uh, the initiative will not be able to, on its own, address all of the needs of students of color. The initiative will partner with uh, a number of organizations on campus, particularly MSPS, uh, to support students of color. Um, but as you well know, as you've just, just, just said, both for alumni and current students, um, there is a real pressing need for Notre Dame to be much more supportive and welcoming of students of color. Uh, and so the work that needs to be done in addition to the kinds of support that the initiative is capable of, of providing, that is a space for students to figure out for themselves how they want to organize, as well as actual 
programming that may well help them think more profoundly about what they want to do. In addition to that, we will, we will need to be in conversation in support of, of other organizations that are helping students at the same time. One of the kind of longer term ways in which the conditions, the situation should improve is really numbers, increasing the number of undergraduates of, of color and increasing the number of faculty of color. And so, to my understanding, this, this first year um, under Provost Miranda, the percentage of students of color has, has risen dramatically. I don't have the exact percentage uh, in my head, but I do know that Notre Dame is well below its, its peer institutions, around 4% in terms of, of black students. So uh, increasing those, the numbers of students of color over time will help to improve the experience of students of color, but that's not sufficient either. Both the students and the faculty have to stay. Uh, we, it, this can't be a kind of revolving door where you get the numbers on the front end and there's not the support for uh, both students and faculty of color to actually call Notre Dame home. And so that's, that's part of the work that IRR is trying to do. But it's going to have to be much broader than, than IRR. Um, Dean Mastillo organized a, a, um, a committee last fall on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, Ernest Morell is, is one of the co is the co-chair and, and Diane Pinderhues is is the other chair, is the other co-chair of this committee. Uh, I had the pleasure of searching of serving on that committee last year. I, I rotated off for this year. Much of what that committee did was fact-finding. Much of the fact-finding through listening, having these listening sessions with graduate students, uh, with almost every department, perhaps every department in the College of Arts and Letters, talking with undergraduates, talking with staff, et cetera, trying to get a sense of what the problems are. And they really are almost overwhelming in terms of, of volume. Um, and so that committee is going to need to report to the dean um, and the two start to devise how to address some of these issues. Um, at the provost and president's level, um, a university-wide look at problems uh, is going to be part of the process as well. But it's going to be a long, longer process. Uh, and I think of the Initiative on Race as a very good big step forward in this process, but by itself, it is not going to solve all the problems that, that you're referring to. Is that helpful? Yeah. Other questions or comments? Yes. You mentioned a number of uh, faculty who were supportive of the initiative historically, and they're coming from the College of Arts and Letters. And uh, have there been other faculty from other colleges who have supported the initiative, this initiative, at any time? Well, when I was talking about faculty, uh, faculty support for this work, I was trying to build the case that the work that the initiative is doing is picking up and building on work that's been, been done historically since the 70s. Much of that has been focused and anchored in the College of Arts and Letters, but there have been faculty um, across the university in, in Clough and um, Keough, um, the professional schools, who have been doing this work in a more localized way. What we hope for the initiative, that this will be the beginning of the way in which so much of that localized work gets support and we can begin to, to build out to see how we can kind of be university-wide in impact, if that makes sense. 
One of the things that um, Provost Miranda uh, made clear to us at the very beginning is that, okay, you can start as a, as a A&L focused group, but we want you to have impact across the university. And that's what we're starting to do. I mean, this really is our first entire, you know, full academic year in existence. And so we're kind of building this kind of, as they, as they say, flying the plane while we're building it. Um, but that is our aspiration, uh, to be able to be supportive of work that's going, that has historically been going on uh, in different segments, at different corners of the university, uh, but hopefully to coordinate it and to support it more. Does that help to answer your question? Other questions? Yes. I do have a question. I'm just trying to figure out how to, how to phrase it. Um, obviously, there's a lot of discussion in the news right now um, about academia and critical race theory sure. and all of that. Um, ha have you received negative attention yet? And how are you planning to position the institute or the initiative um, you know, in resistance to those inquiries. I don't really think this is the best question, or I phrased it perfectly, but I'm basically trying to get at, I think this is amazing, I'm so excited for it, and I'm sure that there, are people, there will be plenty of people who disagree. So what are we doing to make sure that this has legs to stay forever and be as strong as possible? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. Um, no, I, there are no problems with the way you phrased that question. Yes, well, in the short, we really haven't gotten um, pushback, but the operative word is yet. I mean, I, I think that the, we would be naive to think that um, pushback isn't coming, and it may well have already come, and, and you know, it's, it's in the, the, the dean's office, and Sarah is shielding us from it. I don't know. Um, but yes, it makes absolute sense, given, given the political climate, um, that uh, there will be pushback um, from different quarters of the larger Notre Dame community, and when I say that, I'm including on campus and, and, and beyond. How we respond will largely be situational. I mean, it'll be dictated by you know, the, the moment and the issue. But in a larger sense, um, we've, we've talked about this in-house. I mean, we, the, the larger kind of um, ethos around um, resistance or ethos around, around pushback is that we just want to tell the truth. Um, we are going to make mistakes. There's no question about that. And there may be, we may well kind of create moments where, you know, kind of, um, um, criticism uh, can take a, a stronger foothold. We'll just have to deal with that. But in the larger sense, um, to the extent to which we're pointing to problems and trying to marshal resources to solve them, um, I think that that speaks for itself. Um, I think that we'll be fine in the longer run. Um, so, yeah, we're, 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 I wouldn't say that we're bracing. Um, I, it's nothing that I, you know, there are all kinds of things that keep me up at night. That's not one of them. Um, we've made a lot of promises. Everything that I've outlined for you all, almost all of it, is aspirational. Um, there are things on the ground, but again, we're, we're, we're very new, and so we're, we're still building as we go. What keeps me up at night is thinking more systematically about how and when to bring these promises to fruition. They are really high expectations, both on campus and beyond. And um, this is a moment where those expectations need to be met. And if not, um, that will be a major failure on my part specifically and in a larger part for the college. And so that's really what I'm much more preoccupied with. Uh, we've made promises, 
and now we need to we need to follow through. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yes. So I just wanted to, to, to speak to that uh, as well. I was thinking that like resistance manifests itself in a couple of different ways. Like resistance can be hostility, but resistance can also be trepidation and silence and inaction. And people will say with their words that this is a good thing to do. Um, but we'll see whether um, we haven't had the hostility. But I'm really interested is, is, is there the political will to a lot of the questions you are asking? Is there excitement? Is there energy? Are people going to get behind it? Um, time will tell. Um, we certainly have a, a dynamic interlocutor in Mark. Um, but then some of that work is ours, right? Collectively, as, as administrators, as alums, as members of the community. Um, Will we be energetic and enthusiastic about it? Is I think that that's there it has been so far, but that's what I'm interested in seeing. Thank you, sir. I think the uh, general consensus is that diversity is good, and uh, that pertains to industry and academia and just other all aspects of life. As a practical matter, though, in terms of, of uh, organizations. Uh, deciding whether or not they're achieving the goal of diversity, it usually, almost always, comes down to numbers. Mm -hmm. And that's how we measure the success or failure of our diversity efforts. Now, uh, you mentioned that uh, one of our objectives here is to increase the students of color and the faculty of color. Uh, I think it's a real problem making diversity consistent with equity if you're just measuring things by numbers. Is there, were you following that up or did you? Well, I, uh, uh, I, th- I think it's a real problem of how yeah. you get diversity and can be, make it consistent with equity and, and that's a real challenge. If I'm hearing you correctly, I'm, I'm not supposed to kidding, I'm not supposed to walk out of the light. And we, we are taping. and. I don't want to disappear on the tape. Um, but my impulse is just to come down there. But to my, to my ear, what you're saying is very close to uh, what the, the first comment. Um, that yes, we just counting X number of bodies is not sufficient for aspiring, for achieving ultimately the kind of equity that we want. I think that most of us, if not all of us, will agree with that. And so what I was trying to, um, to say in response to the first question is that it's not going to be sufficient for us to simply have more faculty of color and more students of color. We're going to have to retain them and we're going to have to kind of recreate this community in a way in which all of us can claim it ultimately as, as ours. I can speak more on the faculty side of kind of what happens systematically as you increase these numbers. Um, I can talk more on the, on the faculty side than I can on the, on, the, um, on the other graduate side just because I've been thinking about it more often, more recently. But as untenured faculty of color who often are working in subfields, often are working in fields that, um, given the discipline, might not be quote unquote mainstream, then they often are publishing in venues that are not quote unquote mainstream. Often they're publishing in venues that have been created specifically to build the subfield that they're working in. So part of the transformation, the systemic transformation that has to take place for faculty of color to claim this place as, as home, not something that, not a place that is, that is a challenge or is hostile, is to work through and understand and articulate to all the branches and all of the, the committees and levels that evaluate these files for promotion, the value of certain publications, the value of certain methodologies that don't necessarily fit that kind of older 
historically kind of ratified methodology or historically kind of uh, validated venues of publication. I don't, I'm not sure if this is making sense. Um, I, I know for kind of faculty that this is, this is real inside baseball. But what I'm saying is that these structures by which we evaluate faculty will have to be transformed as well to respond and fully appreciate, fully value the new work that these new faculty are doing. Does that make sense? And please, sir, if it doesn't press me, I say this to my students all the time, if I'm not getting across, that's my job, and so you have to tell me when I'm not. I, I agree, and, and you, you answered that it is a challenge to measure the success of, of uh, changing the, the, the faculty. And my point is, when Notre Dame uh, uh, publicly states achievements in this area, they, they use the numbers. Here. Right, right. We have to figure out a, a way of measuring our achievement that is not just based on numbers, but on, on the, uh, the items that you just uh, articulated. I couldn't, That's a very difficult right. thing to measure. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more, and the ways in which we'll understand success um, will be articulated in different venues and in kind of different languages, as it were. I mean, we have a kind of quantitative process for, for measuring success, and that's fairly straightforward. But we'll also have to uh, value as equally qualitative measures. I mean, what people say about their experiences, uh, looking at, you know, not just kind of, hopefully our retention rate for faculty of color increases, but also what those faculty have to say about their experiences here, and how we, you know, how we measure that. Again, we'll, we'll have to build that as we go. That's gonna have to be our last question. Um, you all probably have somewhere else to be. I know that our time is up. I want to thank you all for being here this afternoon and thank you for your time and attention.